Hey everybody, today we are debating whether or not the Quran has scientific errors and we are starting right now. Ladies and gentlemen, thrilled to have you here for another epic debate as we have Jonathan McClatchy with us tonight as well as Nadir Ahmed. And it is going to be a terrific one, folks. We have guest mod Shannon Q with us. She has returned and it's going to be a lot of fun, folks. Want to say, hey, if it's your first time here, consider hitting that subscribe button as we are very excited for a lot of upcoming debates at this channel. So we do want to let you know both of the speakers have their links in the description that I'm putting in there right now. And you, as you're listening to this debate, consider it. If you're like, hmm, I like this. I'm liking what I'm hearing. Go ahead into that description box and click on their link so that you can find more content from them. And want to let you know, it'll be a kind of back and forth, three minutes, three minutes, three minutes, you'll see. Shannon Q is going to be our time moderator. So she will basically be letting the speakers know when their three minutes is up. It'll basically start with Jonathan having three minutes to make a case where he'll argue a case that there is a scientific error in the Bible, followed by Nadir having three minutes to give a refutation. Cran. And, huh? Cran. Cran. Deal. Yeah. Fair enough. So, I mean, I can make a case for both, but that's okay. <laughs> whatever you like. Happy happy to and following that if you have any questions fire them into the live chat i will pull those questions out we'll ask as many as we can at the end but just to respect the time of the debaters because it's getting late especially shannon i think you might be in the farthest time zone east right now yeah i'm in narnia it's 10 30 here almost <laughs> so we'll get through as many as we can so with that very excited to have you and shannon if you have that first timer set for three minutes i will turn it over to you to hand it over to the debaters. I'm ready. I don't have much to say. Jonathan, I believe you're going first. Is that correct? That's right. All right. I'm going to start the timer now. Go right ahead. All right. Well, thanks so much, uh, Shannon, for being our guest moderator. And thank you for uh, James hosting uh, this debate between myself and Nadir. Uh, thanks, Nadir, for coming on. Uh, I'm look, really looking forward to an engaging, spirited discussion. Just let me. Uh, Talk first of all about why this topic is important. Uh, so the Quran in Surah 8522 uh, claims that the Quran is inscribed in tablets in paradise. And the Sunni uh, interpretation of that is that the Quran is eternal, that the Quran, uh, the word of Allah is uh, eternal in the past, never began to exist. Um, and uh, it's believed by Muslims that the Quran was delivered piecemeal to the Prophet Muhammad over a 23 year period between December 609 and 62 when Muhammad died. Uh, Muslims have a, a dictation view of Quranic inspiration, and they believe that um, that uh, at the word of um, God is dictated to Muhammad by the angel Shabriel. Therefore, finding a single error, scientific error in the Quran, I think would be catastrophic to this uh, Muslim claim. So let's look at just, I'm just going to take one example to begin with. Um, I'm going to start by talking about uh, what the Quran has to say about um, astronomy. And... Um, I'll start with um, I'll start with this example from Surah 18. This is a story about dual car name, which I'm sure my opponent is very acquainted with. Surah 18, verse 83 to 86. They ask you about dual car name. Say, I shall now recite to you an account of him. Surely we gave him power on earth and give him means to have everything he needs. So he followed the course until when he reached the point of sunset, he found it setting in a miry spring and found the people near it. We said, O dual car name, either punish them or adopt good behavior with them. Now, Muslims typically respond to this by arguing that uh, this is using the language of appearance, that it just merely appeared that the sun set in a miry spring. However, this, I think, is um, problematic when you get to verse uh, 89 to 90, where we read, thereafter, he followed the course until when he reached the point of sunrise, he found a, rise, a rising over a people for whom we did not make any shelter against it. So that was... There are people who are dwelling so close to where the sun rises that they're getting sunburned. Um, and this seems to suggest that he actually literally thinks that the sun rises and sets in a physical place. Um, and, and in fact, um, how did Muhammad understand this text? Well, fortunately, we don't have to speculate because we can read Sunan Abu Dawood, uh, which is a Sahih Hadith that says, Abu Dar said, I was sitting behind the Apostle Allah who was riding a donkey while the sun was setting. 
He asked, do you know where this sets? I replied, Allah and his apostle know best. He said it sets in a spring of warm water. And I'm going to close with that and um, hand over to my opponent to engage with that and point. Very good. 15, 10 seconds left. Good job. <laughs> Go ahead, Nadia. Oh. Oh, we can't hear you. I won't start the oh, clock until, oh, there we go. Okay, there we go. I can hear yeah. you. Go ahead. Thank you so much, Jonathan. Uh, and thank you for accepting this challenge to see if there are any scientific errors in the Quran. And I have cl I've carefully looked at all these claims which are kind of floating out there on the internet that the Quran has scientific errors in it. And I have found all of them to be in error. Rather, what we find and what will be proved tonight is that the Quran is in complete harmony, harmony with science. And you will never find any explicit contradictions with science. You know, examples like of, of an explicit contradiction with science would be something like what we find in the Bible, that the mustard seed is the smallest seed that you plant in the ground. You could just Google that, Bible, mustard seed, smallest. You'll get what reference I'm talking about. This is an explicit scientific error, and you will never find anything like that. So let's now answer uh, Jonathan's claim about the about the Quran and um, you know the sun setting in a pool of murky water. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen if I may. Um, here we go. And he's right. Muslims always explain that this is talking about appearance, and here's the reason why, because that's what the Quran states. Of course, the English word set, you know, it, it, it gives us a very broad general meaning. There's many good English translations, but we really don't know what's meant there unless we go to the Arabic over here. So if I would agree with, first of all, I would agree with Jonathan. If the Quran said that the sun goes into a pool of murky water, then this is a, a contradiction with science and we can't make that claim. But that's not what the Quran says. The Quran says that it dug rib into a pool of murky water. Now, what does this word mean? Well, I can tell you what it doesn't mean. It doesn't mean go into, it doesn't mean to or enter into or to fall into or anything like that. But Tagrib means it disappears into a pool of murky water, referring to visually. And that's absolutely true. Now, the Prophet Muhammad also uh, came back and said, do you know where the sun goes? Physically goes. Oh, and I remember what I said. If Muhammad, if if, if, the, if the Quran or Muhammad ever stated that the sun physically goes into a pool of murky water, well, then that would be a scientific error. But he said nothing like that. He said, rather, it goes under the throne of God. And this is very important here. Why didn't Muhammad say, oh, it goes into a pool of murky water? So you see, he himself clarified this whole uh, 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 confusion over here. So here it says, dead uh, hebu fi, meaning goes, physically goes into. And this is a very important point here. And, and Jonathan can uh, confirm this. Whatever Muhammad explained to the Quran, that's it. He gave the perfect explanation. Nobody can come and say, oh, well, no, you didn't understand the Quran. Of course, Muhammad understood the Quran. And notice, he did not say it physically goes into a pool of murky water. I think that's my time. Yeah, pretty much spot on. You were at one second. So just to let everybody know, we're going to do this back and forth for about 40 minutes. So this is one of about 13 three-minute sec sections going back, back and forth that I'm keeping track of. So, John, I'll, I'll let you start your three minutes whenever you're ready. Oh, I think you're still on mute, John. Oh, Jonathan? No. Sorry. Sorry, I'm not. Okay. <laughs> okay sorry about that. Whenever you're ready, uh, go ahead. I'll start the time when we start talking. All right. Thank you. Um, so uh, when Nadir uh, comes back to give his next three minute statement, I would like him to interact with the point I brought up in relation to verses 18 and 90 of Surah 18, where it says, thereafter, Jul Karnain followed a course until when he reached the point of sunrise, he found a, it rising over a people for whom we did not make any shelter against it. In other words, the people who are living near the, the place of sunrise are getting sunburned because they're so close to the sun. There's no shelter against it. Um, against its heat. Uh, and so that seems to suggest that it's talking about a physical locality where Muhammad believes the sun rises and sets. Um, and furthermore, I, 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 um, I, I, um, um, my, my opponent brought up, um, he actually showed on the screen a, select, a section from Sahih Bukhari, where it says, uh, narrated to Abu Dar, the prophet asked me at sunset, do you know where the sun goes at the time of sunset? I replied, Allah and his apostle know better. 
He said it goes or travels till it prostrates itself underneath the throne. Notice that the sun's traveling, it's actually moving to be underneath the throne and takes the permission to rise again. And it's permitted and then time will come when it will be about to prostrate itself, but its prostration will not be accepted. And it will ask permission to go in its course, but it will not be permitted. But it will be ordered to return when it has come. And so it will rise in the West. And that is the interpretation of the statement of Allah and the sun runs its fixed course for a term decreed. That is the decree of Allah, the exalted in might, the all knowing. In fact, uh, that's a, an, an allusion uh, to uh, Surah 36, verse 38 to 40, which you may as well quote just now, which says the sun is quickly proceeding towards its destination. That is the designing of the almighty, the all knowing. And for the moon, we have appointed measured phases until it turns pale curved and fine like an old branch of date palm. Neither it is for the sun to overtake the moon, nor can the night outpace the day. Each one is floating in an orbit. And so the Quran here seems to be suggesting that actually the sun and the moon actually share the same orbit um, around the earth. And that's actually the, the explanation for the, the day and the night. That's why it says the sun cannot overtake the moon, nor can the night outpace the day. Each one is floating in an orbit. And so, again, we see this, this really profound scientific error that the Quran makes, uh, and I'll, I'll yield the rest of my time. Okay, perfect. You were about uh, two minutes 15, so go ahead, Nadir. Whenever you're ready, I'll start the time. Oh, well, if the, sun, if the Quran states that the sun and the moon share the same orbit, well, this would be a scientific error. You're right, Jonathan. Now, let me ask you a question, and you could just answer this, you know, yes or no. Does the Quran explicitly say that the sun and the moon share an orbit? orbit? Is that a yes or no question? It's implied. Okay, so when you say implied, this means this is an interpretation. This is, he keeps saying, well, it seems to suggest, so what he's actually doing is that he's putting his own, uh, you know, interpretation into the verse. The Quran says nothing like this. And I have no idea, actually, how you ever came to this conclusion. And this is a very important point. Remember, the, what you, you are going to find a winning argument in this debate in that there are no explicit scientific errors in the Quran. So Jonathan did confirm for us that there's, it does not explicitly say that the sun and the moon share an orbit. That's not in the Quran. This was his implied interpretation. And that's exactly my point. You will never find the scientific errors like you find in the Bible. For example, an explicit scientific error. The mustard seed is the smallest of all seeds. That's actually in the Bible. That's an explicit scientific error. So I have never seen any evidence to show that somehow the Quran is the real interpretation, as Jonathan is saying, is that they share the same orbit. There's nothing like that in the Quran like that. Uh, and then he seemed to have had a problem with, with uh, the Quran says protection against the sun. People there are seeking protection against the sun. So another interpretation was that the sun was so close to them that it was burning them or something like that. Is that correct? That the, that the nearness of the earth and the sun, is, is that what you're understanding, uh, um, Jonathan? Right. Okay. Does the Quran say that the sun was got so near to the earth that it was burning them? Does the Quran explicitly say that? And if so, what verse? It's implied. Finish your time and then I'll come back to it. Well, no, 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 Jonathan, please, please answer my questions. Okay. So neither do, <laughs> neither do the sun say neither the Quran say that uh, the sun and the moon share the same orbit, and neither does it say that the sun got so close. But it gets worse here. What does Jonathan have to say with all the scientists who say the exact same thing which we read in the Quran? Here are scientific references which I've just posted on my screen. It's a, I just googled protection against the sun. And we see that skin cancer is the most common form of cancer. It is also easily preventable with proper protection against the sun. Now, this is what scientists are saying. So if scientists can say this, why can't the Quran say these things? So uh, remember the, the winning argument here. And this is what I said I'm going to defend from the very beginning. There are no explicit scientific errors in the Quran. Everything is their own interpretation that they're twisting into the text. 
Go ahead, Johnson. Uh, okay, you you were pretty much right on time. So I'm just going to say, I noticed that you did ask him a couple of questions in there. That is going to be a component of your time, and I understand the inclination to desire that. But the agreed upon format ahead of time was three minutes and three minutes presenting counter arguments, and there's going to be lots of time for you guys to engage each other directly once once that's complete. And I, I just want to make sure that we adhere to that because I, I agreed to to moderate under those. Uh, pretenses. So you finished your second round and you have about 11 more to go. So Jonathan, go ahead. It's your time. I'll start whenever you speak, to, whenever you start talking. Absolutely. Well, thank you. Um, I'd like to remind uh, my opponent this evening that we're not discussing the Bible. We agreed to talk about the Quranic text. Uh, I'll be happy to talk about the Bible on a future occasion. Um, however, what I would say um, in regards to that is uh, that even if we were to find a scientific error in Bible, I don't think that that would refute Christianity, uh, because we are not committed to a dictation view of inspiration. In fact, that's not the biblical view of inspiration. Uh, we don't believe that the Bible is eternal, that um, and, and uh, that God dictates the Bible. Uh, that's just not what we believe. Uh, Muslims, on the other hand, are committed to uh, inerrancy, and they're committed to the Quran being eternal, uh, that it's uh, completely perfect. Um, and so it's a fundamental problem if we find scientific errors in the Quran, but not a huge problem if we find scientific problems with the Bible. Uh, so that, that's what I'd say to that. Um, on um, Surah um, 18, uh, he, he mentioned uh, that it doesn't explicitly say that, uh, that the reason people were getting sunburned was because they were so close to the sun. He mentioned that, yes, uh, the radiation from the sun can cause skin cancer and so forth. Um, but when we actually read the text, it's, uh, it says, there, thereafter he followed a course until when he reached the point of sunrise, he found it rising over a people for whom we did not make any shelter against it. So uh, it seems to be suggesting here that the reason the people are getting sunburned is because the sun is rising over them. And so they're, they're close in close proximity to the sun. Um, and so that's, um, that's, that's the reason. And in fact, I, I said, we, we actually have interpretation in the, in the Hadith literature um, that it gives us a window of insight into what the early Muslims understood by those those Quranic verses. And Abu Dar, I was sitting behind the apostle of Allah, he was riding a donkey while the sun was setting. He asked, do you know where the sun sets? I replied, Allah and his apostle know best. He said it sets in a spring of warm water. Um, and we also went through the, the other one about the sun um, prostrating itself underneath the throne and taking permission to rise again. And then uh, and being permitted, and then a time will come when it will be about to prostrate itself, and prostration will not be accepted. It will be asked permission to go into its course, but it will not be permitted, uh, and so forth. Um, and uh, and the, the Sahih Bukhari, which is a Sahih Hadith, an authentic Hadith according to Muslims, at least Sunni Muslims, says the sun runs its um, fixed course for a time to creep. That that's the meaning of that verse from the Quran. Um, and so it, it, it applies the interpretation. Um, the Quran also uh, claims that, uh, actually, I'll, I'll finish there because I'm almost out of time. Um, so I'll hand over to the dear. All right. Thank you. Yes, you are right. You know, we, uh, we shouldn't bring up the Bible in this because this is really not the topic. However, I would like to invite you, just as Muslims are, you know, uh, always willing, and, and actually we are leading the debate on does the Quran contradict science? Because we know it doesn't, and we can, as, as you can see tonight, there are no explicit contradictions. Everything he's saying is, it seems to suggest, well, it's implied. Uh, <laughs> because it doesn't, and this is exactly what I was pointing out. There are no explicit contradictions in the Quran. These are all his own interpretations, and we'll deal with it. But Jonathan, I would like to invite you for a discussion, and it doesn't have to be, you know, maybe at a later time, I'll give you all my points and arguments on does the Bible co contradict science in the same way we were debating the Quran. Will you accept that challenge? Jonathan? Uh, it's your time. Will you accept that challenge? Uh, it's your time to make your statement. That would yeah, but as, we, as me and James, we all talked that there will be some interaction. Remember, we just discussed that between, would you like to accept that challenge? We, we can have the interaction um, when, when we get to the, to the Q&A part. That was the agreement. Okay, you don't want to answer that? Okay, that's fine. Uh, you also did not defend the the argument. I said, Taghrib does not mean go into. It means disappears the way it appears. You did not have a refutation for that. Do you, have, do you have one or should we just move on to the next point? Are you going to make your statement as we agreed? 
Okay. You, you you okay. guys need to adhere to the okay. agreed upon. Well, that, we did agree on standard. that. He doesn't want to answer the questions. Um, well, you're, it's not a question yeah. period at this moment, though, to be Sun fair. Sun sets in a pool of murky water so long as it's specifically clear that it's the rib in a pool of murky water. If it said that the sun goes into a pool of murky water, then this is a scientific error. That's why Prophet Muhammad came back in the authentic hadith. He said, do you know where the sun goes? Physically goes. And he explained it goes under the throne of God where it prostrates itself. Uh, meaning this is a, this is a meta, metaphysical, not metaphorical, metaphysical explanation. And both the Bible and the Quran have metaphysical uh, explanations in their books. So this, I hope Jonathan does not... Uh, uh, have a problem with that. So this is a very important point. And Jonathan, you understand Islam, you studied it well enough. When Muhammad وسلم, the prophet of Islam explains something, this is where the sun goes. Then that's it. This is the this is he doesn't hide any information. So actually for somebody to come back and say, oh, but the sun goes, I'm sorry, the sun goes into a pool of murky water. Muhammad, you didn't understand the Quran. This is a statement of kufr and it is <laughs> This is just, this is something which, you know, we as Muslims can never believe. So actually to say that the sun goes into a pool of murky water is considered an act of heresy in our religion. So uh, I would like for you to respond to the word Taghrib and Yedhebu Fi, as we found goes into and to understand the difference between the two. Go ahead. All right. So um, I, I would like um, when Nadir comes back to give his statement, uh, him to respond to the hadiths that I uh, quoted or alluded to, and actually he showed one of them on his screen, uh, where actually uh, the um, Sahih Hadith actually give an interpretation uh, from the early Muslim community as to what this text meant. Um, and um, Muslims or Sunni Muslims at least recognize those as being authentic hadith traditions, um, and so I'd be interested in in, in knowing what Nadir thinks of those verses, because these are explicit um, and affirming my interpretation of those verses, which I think makes the most sense of those passages. But let's, um, I, th I think we can let the audience judge for themselves, uh, if they just read those passages for themselves. Um, let's take uh, another example. Let's go to, um, um, let's go to, uh, let's see, um, Um, let's let's go to what the Quran has to say about um, um, about uh, the flat Earth, for example. This is in uh, in um, this. So if we go if we go to as uh, Surah sixteen verse fifteen, for example, speaks about the purpose of mountains. Um, says he has cast into the earth firmly set mountains, lest it shift with it, with you and main rivers and roads that you may be guided. Um, Surah 21 verse 31 says, we placed within the earth firmly set mountains lest it should shift with them. And we made therein mountain passes as roads that they might be guided. Surah 31 verse 10, he created the heavens without pillars that you see and has cast into the earth firmly set mountains lest it should shift with you and disperse therein from every creature. Surah 78 verse six and seven, have we not made the earth a resting place and the mountains as stakes? Uh, so mountains are literally tent pegs to keep the earth from blowing away. Um, Surah 50 verse 7, the earth, we spread it out and cast therein firmly set mountains and may grow therein something of very, very beautiful kind. Um, so the author of the Quran seems to have thought that mountains were like paperweights that were cast on the earth from above. Um, in uh, Surah 20 verse 53, it says, it is he who has made for you the earth as a as a bed spread out and inserted therein for you roadways and sent down from the sky rain and produced thereby categories of various plants. In Surah 22, verse 65, do you not see that Allah has subjected to you whatever is on the earth and the ships which run through the uh, sea by his command and he restrains the sky from falling upon the earth unless by his permission. Uh, Surah 43, verse 10, the one who has made for you the earth a bed and made for you upon its roads that you might be guided. Uh, and, and, so, and so forth. Um, um, and Surah 88 verse 20, and at the, uh, and at the earth, how, is it, how it is spread out, etc. Um, and so we have numerous passages that seem to indicate that the earth is in fact flat and all um, finished there. Right on. Well done. <laughs> Go ahead and hear. Okay. Uh, yeah, thank you, uh, Jonathan. Um, so you have no defense for the word, I've, as I explained to you, what Tagrib means. And you did quote the hadith of Abu Dhar, where he, where Muhammad asked, do you know where the sun sets? Tagrib. It sets in a pool of murky water. Yes, this is common sense. 
uh, and I have pictures of it for you. It in it disappears f uh, in terms of visually. Now I will ask you. Just ask me. Uh, just just answer very quickly so I can move on to the next point. Do you have a response uh, to the difference between where I made Taghrib and goes physically goes into? Do you have anything to say on that so I can move on to the next point? Well, we agreed like, on the format you, of three minutes. You, three minutes. So if you, you have no refutation. You want to change the format. Jonathan, can you can hold your? How about if, okay. if you pose a question instead of posing it immediately? Jonathan can incorporate it into his next three minutes, and if he doesn't actually answer it to your satisfaction, then you can call him out on it then instead of in real time. I've stopped yeah. the clock so that you can see. Does that seem fair? Well, so that our, you can adhere to the format and still pose your questions. Well, actually, our agreed upon format was that we could talk to each other because I want to confront him on some of the things he said, and he did agree. Yes, we could talk to each other in my. There will be a Q and A after the first forty oh, okay, minutes. Okay. I'll tell you yeah, what. Yeah, yeah. So absolutely, here, my, they'll be back and forth. Okay, why don't you go and start my three minutes then? Okay. Yeah, so here, here, I've already stopped it. So go ahead. Okay, so here's my point. Why I'm pressing him. Uh, Jonathan is throwing out, okay, well, here's a scientific error. And then I provide a refutation that Dalrib does not mean physically go into. He has no, uh, uh, what you could, he's not able to defend his scientific error claim. That's why I'm constantly pushing against him. Hey, you didn't respond to Tagreb. So he's basically throwing out, okay, well, here's a scientific error. Then I refute it. And then he has no counter response. He just moves on to the next point. Okay, so he did not answer Tagreb. He, and so pretty much, I think, you know, um, the problem here, in fact, I have another question. He said that the Quran said that the earth is flat. Uh, is there any verse, Jonathan, which explicitly states that the shape of the earth is flat? Do you know of any verse like that? Do you want to answer or you want me to just... Are, are you yielding your time or... Well, I'm asking, yeah, you could use, just answer yes or no. Do, do you know any verse of the Quran which explicitly states that the earth is flat? Uh, they're implied. Okay, it's implied, meaning it's, it's another one of his interpretations. Okay, so here's my point. This is, I demand, and James, and Shannon, and all the atheists demand that it explicitly states these scientific errors. You know why? Because when we show that the Quran agrees with modern science, you know what the atheists are going to say 100% of the time? Show it to me explicitly where the Quran states a scientific accurate statement, which we've just recently discovered. They want it explicitly. Okay, sometimes we are able to produce it, sometimes we're not. Muslims have produced many videos. Uh, apologizing why we were not it's not exactly explicit and we apologize for that and you know who else uh, demands explicit scientific errors our Christian friends oh yes they do when we debate the scientific errors of the Bible they want it explicit and I understand that I accept that that's why I produce the Bible I mean the, the seed being the smallest seed you plant in the ground scientific error All right. so the You're atheists demand it I'm sorry what's that I was just going to say, you're just at your time. And I, and I okay, did go, stop go, it when we ahead. stopped. And well, I think we can all agree that atheists are the worst. Nobody likes those guys. <laughs> 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 go ahead, John. Okay. Um, so, yeah, he's he's right. Um, in Surah 1886, uh, the sun sets or disappears into a pool of murky water. But I don't think that addresses the, the, the argumentation I raised in my first statement, namely that... Uh, um, later, just a couple of verses later, you have Jules Carnin going so far the opposite direction that he finds the, the, a physical locality where the sun rises and even finds there's the people living nearby who are not sheltered from its heat because they're so close to the sun. And then I, in addition to that, supply to deep sources which affirm the interpretation that I offered. Um, let's take, I mean, he wants explicit examples, so let's take an explicit example. Uh, I mean, and, and I, I reject the uh, that it needs to say in explicit terms the earth is flat in order to qualify as a statement to that effect. Um, this, I mean, it's similar to the Muslim argument, where did Jesus ever say, I am God, worship me, in those exact words. If he didn't say it in those exact words, therefore he can't have claimed deity, uh, divine status. Uh, it's just completely a, a false argument. Um, let's, I mean, let's take the example of embryology. So, um, Surah 23 Verses um, 12 to 14. We created man from the extract of clay, though we made him as a drop of uh, a drop in a place of settlement firmly fixed. Then we made the drop into an alaka, which means leech or suspended thing, a blood clot. Then we made the alaka into a mukka, which means a bit of chewed substance, uh, probably. Um, now, 
what was interesting is that we read the next we read the verse of the verse um, and it says we made uh from the mukka uh bones and we covered the bones with flesh and then we developed him into another creation so blessed is a lot of the best of creators um and so it seems here to suggest that allah first form fashions the the, the skeleton the bones and then subsequently clothes the bones with flesh uh, whereas we know that in fact they happen simultaneously in embryology and so the quran is uh in error on that point um and in fact uh the quran plagiarizes um actually and what the quran states about embryology uh, the same information on embryology that's found in the quran can actually be found in the works of famous ancient scientists such as hippocrates aristotle and galen and most of the descriptions given by those scientists were shown to be incorrect by modern science and that's not only did Muhammad plagiarize the work of others but he also copied inaccurate scientific information um, and so I'd be very interested to hear uh, my opponent's uh, uh, interaction with that point. Uh, I'll finish there. Okay. Okay. So I got it. You've given you shot out at least uh, you know seven, eight different verses. You've I still haven't answered Earth as a bed, uh, the mountain tents pegs, so the Earth doesn't fly away. You're giving me a lot here to answer. So please just let's try to do one at a time. So let me go ahead and answer ask this question. You said that the Quran. Uh, well, you said it implies mountains are tent pegs, so the earth doesn't blow away. Does the Quran explicitly state that? John? It's implied. I mean, I, I can okay. go on, but it's, it's your, your time, interpretation so yeah. again. Okay, gotcha. All right, so the Quran doesn't say that. All right, well, and then you said, well, I don't have to, uh, uh, you know, provide explicit um, uh, verses, which means he doesn't have it tonight. Uh, but yes, I, I believe you should do because this is hypocrisy. Because as I stated, when we debate the Quran agrees with modern science and proves that the Quran is a miracle because it has scientifically correct statements in it, which people have just rediscovered uh, recently. Every atheist, every buddy critic comes out of the woodworks and say, show it to me word for word, word for word. And I don't have a problem with that. They're right. But ah, but when it comes to scientific errors in the Quran, well, uh, I don't have to show you anything explicit. This is hypocrisy. And this is where Christians, I'm sure, if, if they are fair-minded, they're going to agree with me. Because when it comes to the Bible debate, in fact, I just had one on Bible scientific errors. And it's very interesting. Many Christians say, Nadir, it's got to be word for word, not your interpretation. And I'm totally with them. I say, yes. And that's why I tell people, listen, when it comes to the, to the Bible, there's very few scientific errors because a lot of it is based upon interpretation, we should give the Bible the benefit of the doubt. I hope Jonathan will do the same with the Quran. So uh, now he's jumped to um, embryology. Oh, I'm sorry, I, I will get there, but I still have not addressed the issue about the earth as a bed. Uh, the verse which you quoted uh, about the earth being a bed, if you read the context of the verse, it says the earth is created as a bed for you so you could travel in the earth and go through its spacious ways this is clearly not talking about the shape of the earth when it's telling you this is how god has uh, made, made the world so of, a, of an expanse for you to travel okay so you've taken the verse out of context and we can go back and revisit that verse but i think what's happening here tonight is i provide him a refutation and then he just moves on to the next point because he's not able to refute thugrib He's not able to refute anything which I'm actually presenting to him. Um, and he has pretty much conceded tonight that he doesn't have any explicit contradictions with science in the Quran. But he tried to produce one from embryology. He threw all this plagiarism stuff. Okay, I'm playing catch up. Let me deal with embryology. Well, first of all, the Quran does not say that bones are formed between the flesh. This is one of his interpretations again, but it does not say anything like that. And the science doesn't state that bones are for, I'm sorry, bones and uh, flesh are formed simultaneously. So he's not only misrepresenting science now, but he's also misrepresenting the Quran. There are two misrepresentations spinning around, uh, you know, to try to produce some type of scientific error. Uh, and then he made your oh uh, i'm i'm so sorry but you've just you've exceeded i let you go a little bit over oh, okay. um sorry. Uh, so it's, it's going to be john's turn that resolves round six so you guys essentially have two more rounds of back and forth like this at three minutes each and then we'll open up dialogue and i know nadir's excited <laughs> he's ready for it also <laughs> atheists am i right oh my god <laughs> go ahead Jonathan. 
Um, okay, so um, on on Sur twenty three, um, I want I want to know how he interprets that verse. I'm especially interested in uh, his interaction with the fact that the Quran engages in explicit plagiarism from uh, Galen and other um, ancient scientists. So um, um, Galen describes the stages of development. Uh, he writes that the first is that in which the form of the semen prevails. At this time, the proper was to the all marvelous still calls it semen. Uh, the next stage, uh, he tells us, is when it has been filled with blood, and heart, brain, and liver are still un unarticulated and unshaped. This is the period that Hippocrates calls fetus. And this is, I think, reflected in Surah 22, verse 5, where we read that then out of a morsel of flesh, partly formed and partly unformed. Um, and Galen also tells us, and now the third period of gestation has come. Thus, um, it um, uh, caused flesh to grow on and around all the bones. And he tells us that the fourth and final stage, at the fourth and final period, is at the stage when all the parts in the limbs have been differentiated. And, and so that is very similar to what we read in the Quranic text. Um, and, uh, and, so, and so that seems to me to be a glaring uh, um, plagiarism uh, in the Quran. And in fact, uh, the um, the, Ar the Arabic word fa, um, which is translated and in Surah 23, verse 14. Um, yes, it, so um, it, it can be taken to refer to one thing having sequence one after the other, or um, it could, uh, in principle, be taken to, uh, to uh, indicate simultaneous uh, formation. The problem with doing that is that uh, in the previous part of the verse, uh, it's, it's translated um, then. Um, otherwise, you let, um, you end up with other problems. We created man from nature to play. Then, same words, we made him as a drop in the place of settlement from a fixed. Then we made the drop into an alaka. Then we made the alaka into a mukka. And then, if you want to, you have to continue translating the word the same way throughout your your interpretation. Um, and so, then the most natural way of continuing to read that verse would be: and we made him, we made from the mukka bones, and we covered the bones with flesh. Then we developed him into another creation. So blessed is Allah, the best of creators. So the, um, the bones and flesh form simultaneously. They don't form one after the other. Um, I'm also um, I'm uh, the the verses I gave on the on the mountains uh, seem to indicate uh, that mountains are like paperweights that they're thrown um, on onto the earth to keep the earth um, from moving. That they're cast onto the earth literally, um, whereas actually mountains. Um, are pushed up by um, plate tectonics. They actually come from um, within the earth, not they're not placed onto the earth from above, which seems to be what the Quran implies. Um, um, I'm also curious to understand um, how my opponent interprets the various verses that indicate that um, stars are missiles that Allah hurls at demons to strain the ears in the direction of the heavenly councils. I'm, um, so I'm so sorry. I let you look... Yeah, I let you exceed okay. by the exact same amount that I let oh, okay, him sure. exceed last time, just to be fair. Sure. So please, this this will be your last back and forth, just to, to let you guys know yep. so after after this round. And then we're going to be going into, um, actually, no, it'll be, be Nadir's turn. And then after this, you'll have one more back and forth. Nadir, you'll have the last word before we go into the Q&A. So please go ahead. I'll start your three minutes as soon as you start speaking. Okay, so uh, the Quran states that the bone uh, we covered the bones uh, with flesh. Uh, and so I think uh, 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 Jonathan was saying that basically the, uh, uh, the Quran is claiming that bones were created first, then the flesh. Uh, Jonathan, is there any explicit verse you can share with us stating that bones were created first? It's your time, so make your point, okay. and then I'll. This I'll might be response. another one of the interpretations because there is no such thing. Bones are created first. It just says we covered the bones with flesh, and also, you know, and this is kind of irrelevant, but you're also misunderstanding science. Uh, bones are actually created first. I mean, the Quran doesn't say that, but I just want to educate everybody. Um, bones actually are created around the seventh week of uh, inside the embryo, as you can see my references over here. Let me put this over here. Uh, and then when you get to the uh, get to the flesh, well, I'm just using muscle as flesh. I'm just kind of, maybe that's uh, 
uh, what, what's meant over here, that's about 13 weeks, okay? So I think there is a myth going on. I think it was created by this guy named uh, P.Z. Meyer, who's one of these, um, anyways, atheist apologists who masquerades as some kind of embryologist. But um, he, uh, mm. he, he basically um, created this myth that, you know, bones and flesh are created together. Therefore, uh, you know, it's some kind of scientific error or something like that. Uh, so you could see my references over here. There's uh, this. is so, But anyway, like I said, the Quran doesn't even say that. So it doesn't. Uh, you know, there's no need to even go there. So let's, uh, so not only chase after, you've thrown a lot of points at me and I apologize if I'm not addressing all of them, but please try to bring up one point at a time. Uh, so I think the latest one you tried to say was um, the whole thing about plagiarism. And I didn't get that. Just give me one statement from Galen and how that matches up with the Quran. Just give me one, because I, I didn't understand. Yeah, I'll go over that in my time. Okay, because I, I, I'm sorry, yeah, I just didn't understand what you were saying over there. Uh, I, and you know what's really disturbing about all this is you're here as a Christian trying to challenge the Quran, uh, you know, if it has scientific errors, and we love it. Thank you so much. This is an excellent opportunity to prove that the Quran is in perfect harmony with science. Uh, but, you know, I really wish that you as uh, Jonathan, and when we get to the Q&A time, we'll talk more about this, will also uh, accept the challenge as does the Bible contradict science? Because what my experience is, people like David Wood, uh, Christian, Prince, Sam Shimon, they all run away from this challenge, but not us. We'd love to debate this thing. Uh, and let me see if I, and let me see if I address your other uh, you have uh, about eight seconds. Here. Eight seconds. Uh, yeah. You still haven't addressed the whole issue of Thugrib because unless you understand what this means, then the whole issue of sun setting in a pool of murky water is mute. And so you're not able to address the refutations here. Go ahead. All right. That's your last back and forth. And then you guys can have at it. All right, whenever All right. you're ready, John. <laughs> All right, so um, as for the plagiarism in the Quran, um, I, I gave examples uh, earlier. Um, we, we read, um, so the, the, the first is that in which the form of the semen prevails at this time, property is still called the semen. And slow, then, slow, uh, slow. Okay. a little bit slow. So, yeah. so uh, the, the next stage is when it's been filled with blood and heart, brain, and liver are still unreticulated in the shape. This is the period that Hippocrates calls fetus. Uh, this is reflected in Surah 22.5, where we read that end of our morsel of flesh partly formed and partly unformed. Um, and, uh, and then uh, Galen continues, and now the third period of gestation has come, thus it, uh, that it caused flesh to grow on and around all the bones. And so he believed that bones were great, were Form first and then flesh grew afterwards. Um, whereas, in fact, you're wrong. Uh, bones and flesh form simultaneously during embryonic development, um, and uh, and so forth. So uh, that's what I'd say on the plagiarism issue. Um, I, I'm also I'm really curious to um, to know what you think of the uh, the stars as missiles that Allah uses to hurl the demons to strain the ears in the direction of the heavenly councils. Um, in Surah 67, verse 5, we have decorated the nearest sky with lamp, lamps uh, and have made them devices to stone the devils, and we have prepared for them the punishment of hell. Surah 72, verse 8 and 9, we have sought to reach the heaven, but we found it filled with stern guards and flames, and that we used to sit at places therein to listen. But if one will try to listen now, you will find a flame in ambush for him. Surah 37, verse 6 through 10, Verily, we have decorated the nearest sky with an adornment, the stars, and have made them a security against every rebellious devil. They cannot listen to the upper realm and are hit from every side to be driven off, and for them there is a lasting punishment. However, if one snatches a little bit, he is pursued by a bright flame. Um, and how is this interpreted by Hadith? By Hadith? Well, Sahih al-Bakari says about the stars, Abu Qatada mentioning Allah's statement, and we have adorned the nearest heaven with lamps, 67 verse 5. And said, the creation of these stars is for three purposes, i.e. as decorations on the sky, as missiles to hit the devils, and as signs to guide travelers. So if anyone tries to find a different interpretation, he is mistaken and just wastes his efforts and troubles himself with what is beyond his limited knowledge. Um, and so uh, there, again, the Hadith is very helpful in giving us the proper interpretation of those passages. Um, and I'll yield the rest of my time. All right. I'm not even going to bother starting the timer for Nadir because I have a feeling you're just going to fly right into the Q&A portion <laughs> with your time. <laughs> so enjoy, guys. Have fun. I'll stop right. you if you start miss if you don't misbehave, though, because I'll lay the hammer down. But have, be, be respectful and have fun.
Go ahead. Go ahead okay, so should I, let, let me see if I can respond to that real quick. Uh, well, first of all, in fact, I'm gonna share my desktop so I, just so you can uh, see the verse here. Um, you keep saying that stars are used as missiles. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so if we actually look at the verse over here, you know, uh, if the word the word which which it says about using as missile, it says lamps, the, and it says thus we have used lamps, uh, you know, to shoot to to uh, basically to shoot at the at the at use as missiles for the devils. Okay, so what will science say about this? I mean, you could probably give me your interpretation, but what would science say about this? Well, first of all, science will say nothing about this because this deals with gods, goddesses, heaven, hell. They absolutely won't even look at this. So this, this can never contradict science since they're not going to look at it because it affirms the divine. It, it, it affirms things like devils and things like that. That's the first point. So the whole point, so the whole argument, I think, you know, it's kind of defeated right here, but it doesn't say stars. So let me correct you also on that as well. It says lamps. Okay. Uh, and, and so now from a scientific point of view, if they ever were to look at this, they're going to say, okay, it says the Quran says lamps over here. Uh, that has to represent something. And they're going to look for some kind of metaphorical meaning. They're going to try to look to see what lamps could represent. So this could never contradict science. And that's what we are here to discuss. Uh, and so now you discussed an issue of plagiarism, but you say the Quran reflects it. Well, you said that, you know, we, we've already talked about the bones being created first. The Quran doesn't say this. Science doesn't say this, that they both form simultaneously. So it, it's a mute point. So you, uh, the, the whole issue of, of plagiarism, it's an interesting topic, but I feel it's a little bit off topic here. We want to know tonight, where are is there any explicit verses in the Quran which contradict science? So... Uh, I don't know how many more minutes I have, I guess, uh, before we get into the QA, but what we're seeing here, uh, and so you, you tried to say, you know, your explanation about how the Quran is uh, <laughs> plagiarizing Galen, that doesn't make any sense, okay? Nothing in the Quran, there's no sentence in the Quran which can be taken ad verbatim, explicitly is taken from Galen or anybody else. And that, that's why Jonathan said it's reflected. It's reflected like that. So if Muhammad was, or even the concept is not there, okay? But anyways, um, so I, I really, I wasn't able to really <laughs> grasp where this plagiarism was, but it's really off topic. So I think we're seeing a winning argument emerge. There are no explicit verses in the Quran which contradict science. Everything, all this list of, of scientific errors in the Quran, this is all their own interpretation that they're forcing the text to read. And it's hypocrisy. Because I tell you what, when we debate Quran and science, how it agrees with science, they're all going to switch gears and say, show it explicitly word for word where that scientific, where the Quran is predicting science. I want it word for word. And I'm like, okay, all right, no problem. And the Christians ask the same thing. But, I, I, and I think so, really, I'm pretty much done here. I don't think there's really any point to go forward. If you give another example of scientific error, it's going to be one of his interpretations again. He's going to say, oh, well, no, the Quran doesn't really say that. It's just implied. It's reflected. It seems like it. That's well, you're definitely in the Q&A portion now. So if you have questions, yeah. now's the well, time. So here's my question. Okay, <laughs> unless, you're, unless you really are done. <laughs> okay, so Jonathan, let me ask you a question. Why don't you want to debate the Bible and science? Does it have scientific errors? Well, this particular debate... No, later, later. On the Quran. Yeah, no, not, not, not right now. I'm talking about later. Right. When did I say I didn't want to debate it? Can we do it? Um, I just oh. think it's an important topic because even discovering scientific errors in the Bible wouldn't, wouldn't significantly reduce my confidence in the truth of Christianity. But it might cause me to revise my view of inerrancy or inspiration or something like that. So I don't really see it as an important enough topic to debate on. You know, one of the mi amazing miracles of the Quran is that not only does it have no explicit scientific errors in it, but it corrects the scientific errors in the Bible. And this is amazing. And you've seen my debate with Jay Smith in which I demonstrated that. And I think that's one of the reasons why you're backing away from this. But, you know, that's okay. You know, you know, Jonathan, it is an important debate, as many would like to hear that. I'm going to ask you one last time. Will you open up the Bible for a debate on scientific errors, just like we did with the Quran? To be honest, I don't think it's an important enough topic. 
um, because okay. we I, yeah. I, I don't think it's as, uh, it's a high stakes issue when it comes to the Bible, whereas it is a very high stakes issue with regards to the Quran. Yeah. Well, there are many scientific errors in the Bible and they're indefensible, as you saw in my debate with Jay Smith. And I think that's a reason why, quite frankly, and I don't mean any offense here, you're running away from that topic. And not just you, but other Christians like Christian Prince, uh, David Wood, and Sam Shimon, they all know that there's scientific errors in the Bible. And, but you know, for us, it's important because the Quran corrects that. Now, if you like a demonstration, I can demonstrate that for you. So do you have any questions for me? Absolutely. Um, so uh, let's talk about um, Sahil Bikari, um, volume four, chapter three, number 421, which provides an interpretation of the verses I talked about in relation to the stars serving as missiles that Allah hurls the demons. Um, so it, let me read it again. About the stars, Abu Qatada mentioning Allah's statement, and we have adorned the nearest heaven with lamps, and said the creation of these stars is for three purposes, i.e. as decorations on the sky, as missiles to hit the devils, and as signs to guide travelers. So if anybody tries to find a different interpretation, he is mistaken and just wastes his efforts and troubles himself with what's beyond his limited knowledge. Does that, does that text not interpret that verse of the Quran to indicate that the purpose of stars is as missiles to hit devils? Okay, so one question I have for you. Well, first of all, you're, what, what, what I see happening here is you've jumped out of the Quran and now you're trying to make your case for the, in the Hadith. You think maybe you can score some points over there as far as trying to find some scientific error. But as I showed you in the Quran, it clearly says lamps. It does not say stars. And I showed that to you. Do you have any, uh, do you have any rebuttal to that? Then I'll address the rest of your points. So, so um, what are those lamps if they're not stars? Is, well, see, now it goes, it goes into a metaphorical interpretation. And well, the whole issue, I think, is mute. It, why are we even talking about it? Because this can never contradict science. Science won't even deal with it because they're going to say we don't accept devils. We don't accept angels. We don't accept heaven or hell. It's like me going into a classroom and saying, hey, you know where, he where heaven's located? Yeah, okay. Look, the Quran got it wrong because heaven, it says it's over here, but that's not true. It's, it's a silly argument. Do, yeah, do you because, accept the Sahih Hadith? Oh, absolutely, yeah. You do. So you, you accept Sahih Bakari's interpretation of that verse? Uh, it's one of the many interpretations we, we, we could give. But see, the thing is, when we talk about Sahih, when we talk about Sahih Bukhari, is it quoting Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, or is it just some of the some people are coming with metaphorical interpretations? Because now we are forced with a metaphorical interpretation of the word uh, because of the verse because the verse itself doesn't say stars it says lamps some people are taking it as a metaphorical interpretation and that's totally fine but remember this is not a statement coming from muhammad but some of the uh tabi'in people like that are saying and that i'm okay with it because it doesn't contradict science in but any way nonetheless it does give a window of insight into the interpretation of those texts by the early muslim sure, communities sure yeah and well, uh, it doesn't and it's but the most natural way of reading see, it. Okay, but we are here, and that's fine. We are here to see, are there any explicit word-for-word -word contradictions in the Quran, just like we find in the Bible, for example, the Bible says, and the mustard seed is the smallest of all seeds. That's, a, that's an explicit scientific error. The smallest seed that they're familiar with and they use. That's not what the Bible says. It's what is, is the most... Is, um, oh, well, we won't, let's not do, we'll discuss it, but, Bible. Yeah. You already said you don't want to debate it. That's okay. Yeah. That's fine. But my point here is we have come to find are there scientific errors in the Quran explicitly? And you were not able to produce any tonight. You kept saying, well, it's implied. Uh, it suggests. Um, uh, it seems like it. That's not, uh, uh, you know, so I think the debate is really over. Why are we even going any further? If you don't have an explicit verse, Let's, let's end it here. Uh, John Jones is fighting tonight. You know, I want to go out and check it. Out that fight and uh, are you in, are you in the UK? No, I'm in the US. Oh, okay, okay. So, if you got nothing as far as an explicit contradiction with science, let's just call it a day. From the Quran. Well, I, I just gave you one. Uh, I gave you one. several. That was in Hadith. That was not in the Quran. And that okay. doesn't contradict science. But so, so let, let me let me ask you, yeah. what do you yeah. think the lamps are? Well, we are forced to give it a metaphorical interpretation. And, and metaphor for what? 
for lambs. It, it's referring to something. Lamps are a metaphor for lambs? No, no. I'm saying that the word inside the Quran, lamps, is metaphorical to represent something. But the problem here is, uh, this is what I'm objecting to here. You are supposed to produce a scientific error. But, but it, it says in Surah 37, yeah. verily we have decorated the nearest sky with an adornment, the stars. Um, okay. So even if you translate that lamps, uh, it's it, they're still decorating the sky. And so well, what do you two believe is decorating okay, well, the sky? Well, which, which verse are you talking about? This is in Surah 37. Surah 37, what verse? Uh, verse 6. Chapter, verse 6 through 10. Okay, so let's pull it up. Quran uh, 37, verse 6. Mm -hmm. Is that what you said? Yep. Okay, so let me share my desktop. Let's look at it together. Let's see if we can figure this out. Got a little bit of time. So what we'll do is maybe give you guys like a five-minute uh, warning just to let you know. We'll go into the Q&A pretty quick here. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what you... Okay, so I got the verse over here. It says, indeed, we have in adorned the nearest heaven uh, with an adornment of stars. So this right. is now a completely different word called waqib, which is can be referred to as stars. But the word inside uh, the words which you quoted as far as missiles, that's masabeh. So this is a complete different word here. So what's your what's your what's your issue with here? What's, so, what's the problem here? So do you believe that those lamps are stars or not? Maybe. Um, and if they're not stars, what is their per what are they adorning? Okay, the word here is kawakib. The word inside the words about the missile about the missiles uh, that is masabeh, which means lamps. These are two different words. So, uh, I guess my question, I, I'm not understanding you. It seems like you're trying to create a controversy out of nothing here. Uh, so, what's what's the problem with this verse so here? You, what do you we said you, 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 you said that the stars are actually lamps and lamps is metaphorical. Yeah. Um, no, but this is very I'm not saying anything. Um, this is uh, you. This is your opportunity to produce it a says, scientific. Verily, well, well, we, John, let me listen. It's, yeah, yeah, okay. It says, "Verily, we have decorated the nearest sky with an adornment, the stars, and have made them a security against every rebellious devil." Mm -hmm. um, so what? So what is decorating the sky? Okay. So indeed, we have adorned the nearest heaven with an adornment of stars, kawakib. Okay. The verse which you quoted about missiles, that's masabeh. This is talking about lamps. Okay, so but what you are saying is that masabeh is kawakib. Is that what you're saying? I'm saying I'm saying that the la the star the stars are decorating the sky, which implies okay. that they are literal stars. What? What do you understand about that? That's uh, what it uh, says. Okay. Currently, we have decorated the nearest sky with an adornment, the stars. Okay. And? And what else would be decorating the sky except for stars? How does this contradict science? I'm not, I'm not understanding. Because the stars are then described as um, missiles, Allah rules the demons. No, well, not in the Quran. In, in the Quran, stars are not described as missiles. Okay, those, those are masabah. And even if it does, it does not contradict science. I've already explained the third time, science won't even deal with a verse because they say this is affirming devils, heaven, hell, angels. So they're never going to even look at it. Okay. They're never even going to deal with so, it. What, so let, let, science, let's... Uh, Here's what science, I've seen a scientist actually do this. When they saw the word masabeh, what they interpreted as meteors. They said, these are the meteors. Okay, and I'm fine with that. That's fine. So this is a word open for interpretation. Now, here's what I'm seeing here. And this is what I, see, what people are trying to do. They're trying to find verses which are open for interpretation so they can have some wiggle room to create a controversy. But all of this monkey play is being performed because they cannot find an explicit were uh, explicit statement in the Quran which contradicts science, so they go to vague and ambiguous verses and try to create a controversy out of there. So I think we're done, dude. Let's just call it. This a is probably a good time to actually go into the Q and A. There's a lot of questions, yeah. and I, I'm not sure if we'll ever establish whether or not stars are lamps. 
So <laughs> we'll just move on. <laughs> we'll just, we'll leave that an open question if lamps are stars and stars are lamps and who's hurling them at who. So the first question is from SJ Thomason. And did Muhammad know those in the Arctic Circle couldn't follow the Ramadan fasting sunrise to sunset because they have 24 hour light summers? Yes, he did. So there is actually a hadith which talks about the Antichrist, that when the Antichrist comes, uh, it said a, day, a day will be like a, I forgot how long, it's going to be a very long day. So they so asked, how are we going to pray? How are we going to do these things? Which is what he's referring to, fasting. He says, make an estimate of time. Let me see if I can, uh, if I, if I can produce that for you, uh, that actual hadith which I'm talking about here. Yeah, okay. okay. Let me share my desktop just so I can get it in front of you. Uh, sure. and, you and I've got the references here. Um, also, to... a quick reminder as he pulls that up, folks, I want to let you know all of the super chats from tonight's debate, this one that we're in right now. Actually, your super chats, we want to say thank you. They will be going to victims of sexual assault. If you hadn't heard that, I think we announced it at the start of the debate. Just want to let you know. So, let her rip. This is uh, one time where I'm like, I'll, I'll push you. I'll say, hey, uh, consider making a super chat. That's for a good cause, 100%. Okay, thanks, New Year, for your patience. Floor is yours. Okay, no problem. So it's basically talking about this is the time when the Antichrist comes. It says a day's prayer, uh, you know, is going to like equal, is going to be like equal. It's like one day is going to equal one year. So he said, you must make an estimate of time so that you can do your prayer. So this is my reference right over here, and you can pull that up. Go ahead. Okay. What's the next question? I, 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 most of these are for you. <laughs> so, okay. SJ again, Nadir. Who is the Medi? And how does he relate to the book of Revelation and the Antichrist? Well, it's a good question. But I think it's off topic as far as science is concerned. Okay. I can get, there's more, there's more. We can keep going. And more from SJ too. So she'll get her okay. fair shake. Uh, okay. Again, from SJ. Was Jesus crucified? If not, who was? Well, that, that's off topic. We should stick to science. I, I'm just reading the questions that were given to me. I'm sorry <laughs> if you feel that way. But all right, SJ again. Which person's life should be revered, Jesus or Muhammad's? Well, you know what? You know, a lot of people ask me this question, you know, why, you know, you know what makes Islam true? There's so many religions out there. Well, you know, I believe if we look at science, it proves, it points to one religion. Science has a deep implication in Islam because look how it has impacted our life. I'm going to just give you an example. Uh, you know, like let's just take alcohol, for example. Today we find out from science that drinking alcohol, even a moderate amount, for pregnant women is disastrous. For five-year-old kids, you don't, you don't feed them beer. So what we, but this was all discovered in 1971. But uh, until then, if you look throughout history, humanity suffered from fetal alcohol syndrome uh, they saw, and they used to give their children beer to drink, five-year-old kids to drink beer. This is in the medieval times. We've seen this. But the Quran says inside chapter five, verse 90, forbids alcohol. And by doing so, but not only that, but the Quran has something which no religion has. It has implementation, meaning it has intellectually convinced people not to drink alcohol and not to fight against it and try to, you know, <laughs> fight against prohibition and things like that. So here's my question, which I have for everybody. How many children did the Quran save from brain damage, neurological uh, disorders by preventing the people to drink alcohol? So that's a question I actually have for Jonathan. Can you answer that? Do you, just give me a rough amount. How many children do you think have been saved? That's not an argument for, that's not relevant to the topic. No, this is science. I mean, this is a huge impact which the which the science of the Quran have on our on our lives. This is very relevant. Well, I mean, if we want to talk about um, what Muhammad had to say about personal hygiene, no, that's a different topic, dude. We're talking about alcohol. Okay. Yeah. But but I mean, you have to take the, what the Quran says and, the, and the, what the Hadith says in its totality, um, not simply cherry picking verses. How many children um, so for, did the so Quran for example, save? So so Sahih Bukhari verse. Uh, so, Sayyid al Bukhari 537 says, Narrated to Abu Huraira, the Prophet said, If a housefly falls in the drink of any one of you, you should dip it in the drink. For one of its wings is a disease, and the other has a cure for the disease. Um, okay. And, 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 and Sunan Abu Dawood 67 says, I heard that the people asked the Prophet of Allah, peace be upon him, water is brought for you from the well of Buddha. It is a well in which dead drugs, menstrual cloths, and excrement whoa, 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 whoa. The people are the thrown. Day, 
the Don't Messenger of Allah debate. replied, Verily, water is pure and is not defiled by anything. So Muhammad encouraged people to drink water no, uh, that no, no, had been polluted by dead dogs, menstrual cloths, and excrement. So is this a track you really want to go down? Yeah. You Okay. Do you want me to answer that for you? Yeah. Oh, gosh. Okay. Let me answer that for you. Okay. Well, first of all, this is a question, you know, I've, I've asked, you know, Jonathan, he didn't want to answer. Actually, I had an atheist friend. I, I asked him the same question. He actually did a calculation as far as today is concerned. Um, you know, how many kids have been saved by fetal, by, by, from fetal alcohol syndrome and five-year-old kids drinking beer? Because they used to do that in the, in the Christian medieval Europe. He, can, he, uh, he basically came up a, a far, as far as one, in one year in today's time, right around 46,000. It's a rough estimate. Again, it's not, you can't, don't pin me down to that. But if we it look could, through history, we can see that millions of children have been saved from FAS and giving beer to little kids, which was common practice back then. Now, okay. Jonathan just ran away from the question. Now, let me answer the question about the well of Burda or something like that, which you were which you were uh, referring to, am I, am I, which, which I believe mm -hmm. um, you are mentioning. Okay, which really, this is unfair, Jonathan, okay? Because that was, I just asked you a question and you shotgunned me. Well, look over here in the Quran and hygiene. This is unfair, but I'll go ahead and address that. Okay, so if you turn on the TV, uh, you will find many people drinking from water even more filthier than that. Okay, in fact, let me go ahead and share my desktop. You'll find people who are, you know, uh, people like survivalists, people who uh, basically, uh, uh, you know, try to show you how to survive in the de desert. And so the truth of the matter is the water which you just described here is actually the drinking water for millions of people in this world, in the world today. Okay. And that's very sad. But even in today, you will see people drinking out of water like that. Because if this is your only source of water, you have no choice but to drink from that water, okay? So that's the first point. I'm just addressing the science over here, okay? So let me go ahead and show you people drinking from this putrid water. There you go. Oh God, oh no, that's not good. Why are they doing <laughs> no, that? Why that? No. Okay. Is the so argument here's... that it's good? Like, I don't, why? Okay, okay. let me, okay, oh, guys, let me so explain. Bad. Okay, okay, let me, let, me, let, me, let me explain. So there's many layers of foolishness going on over here. When Muhammad made that claim, he was not telling you which sources of water are safe to drink. The Arabs already have this knowledge, okay? That's the first point. They're just coming to see if this water is sanctified from a religious perspective. So when we approach this hadith, we have to have some common sense. Now look at the water, look at the word which he says pure, okay? So it says over, I wanna get the actual hadith in front of you. Um, and, so, and says over here, um, what, let me see, this is a reference I'm quoting for you. Yeah, so here is the same word which is actually used over here. So when he said, no, this water is pure, it's not talking about in terms of bacteria, whether this is a drinking source, that's a very foolish assumption. Arabs in the desert back then, they're not coming him to ask this question, but rather they're coming to him to basically ask, is this, uh, is this religiously sanctified? Because the same word over here. For uh, what usage? For, for wudu, this is something called I'm wudu, sorry, this which... is not my role. I'm t this is just fascinating to me because okay, that, yeah. <laughs> that's not my role. I'm sorry, you have, you, you have way more questions. So I'll get, let you guys get okay. past this. Okay. I, yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, let me, let me just read this hadith, okay? It says, one of the wives of the prophet took a bath from a large bowl. The prophet wanted to perform ablutions uh, which is wudu, uh, and take from the water uh, left over. She said to, she said, uh, she said to him, uh, verily I was sexually defiled, but the prophet said water is not defiled here. So here he's not talking about whether it's clean, drinkable or something like that, but this was for ablution to perform a religious ritual. So, um, so this is the same word which is used in the hadith. So the context, number one, the context was not for drinking. That's not. It is talking about what is religious, uh, you know, whether this water is sanctified okay. or not. So I have a question okay. on that. So yes. I have a question on that. So Sin Ibn Majah 520 says, and they quote, it was narrated that uh, Jabir uh, bin Abdullah said, we came to a pond in which there was a carcass of a donkey 
So we refrained from using the water until the messenger of Allah came to us and said, water is not made and pure by anything. Then we drank from it and gave it to our animals to drink. And we carried some with us. Yep. yep. So does that not say they drank from it explicitly? I mean, you want right. explicit, explicit statements. Yeah. It well, says we drank from it. Okay. So my question to you is why would you assume that the Arabs didn't know how to drink from different water sources until they met Muhammad? That's my question for you. I mean, you have to have common sense when you approach this hadith. When he, when Muhammad said this, look, the word which you will act in that hadith, where he said the water is, is pure, it's this word right here. Okay, yajnab. Okay, see that? Here he uses the same word to explain that this is for evolution over here. So when we look at the context in which Muhammad was, was referring to, he was talking about, is this sanctified? Whether water and, and this and actually this type of drinking water, which you see today, it is the only drinking source. It is what you are going to find for thousands of miles. You will come across this. And they had their own filtration techniques. They had their own way to drink from different water sources, just like people are doing today. You see, it's horrible that this is the only drinking source for millions of people, even today. So just think if Muhammad said, oh, no, 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 that's dirty water. Don't drink from that. You would get millions of people dying. OK, so but anyways, like I said, we have to have some common sense. But the context. But once again, this is not the Quran. I want everybody to understand this is we're going into the Hadith because the Quran debate is one. We have no explicit scientific errors in the Quran. And so now we're jumping into the Hadith and we're fine. I'm fine with that. OK. Uh, and so we're also not going to find any scientific errors in the Hadith as well. But anyways, like I said, uh, let me stop my screen. We have, we have more questions we, okay. that we went, down the, we went down the water purification <laughs> yeah. rabbit trail for a while. Yeah. That's my fault because yeah. I was like, yeah. where is this going? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I want to is... see what happens. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So the next question is from Jay Shai Nadir. Mm -hmm. Surah yeah. 6, 115 and 1827 state that no one can change the words of Allah. Surah 568 says to uphold and obey the Torah and the Gospels. How mm -hmm. can they be wrong then? Um, How can so, the Gospels uh, uh, be wrong, well, I'm assuming is what that means. Yeah, this is kind of off topic, but when it talks about nobody can Most change of these the words. <laughs> yeah, but when it talks about nobody can change the words of God, this is talking about the decree of God. And when it talks about, uh, I forgot the other verse, but I tell you what, let's stick with science here. Okay, so caustic soda. Oh, hey, caustic soda. Um, I'm probably pronouncing that wrong. And if I am, I'm sorry. Is this healthy when a fly alight, alights in anyone's vessel, he should plunge it all in for in one of its wings, there's a disease and in the other, there's a cure. We've covered that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that was, that was addressed. Uh, everyday skeptic could Nadir define explicit such that John would know what wouldn't be mere interpretation. Well, see, the thing is, um, because there are no explicit scientific errors in the Quran, everything Jonathan brought up was vastly open for interpretation. The thing about the well of Buddha, that was actually in the Hadith. We're not even in the Quran. So what we have basically proved tonight, 100% case that that the Quran is in complete harmony with science. In fact, I'll even extend, we could debate this again. There's so many lists of what people can try to find as far as scientific errors. If you want, we can do this debate again. I'm, I'm very much open for it. You know, unfortunately, you know, we, some people are afraid to debate their scriptures, but we are not like that because we know our Quran is 100% agreement with science. But not only that, look at the good it has produced humanity. It has saved millions of people from fetal alcohol syndrome. And it's a, and, and we know I have this joke when they say, why is Islam the true religion? I say, listen, in our religion, in, in the Islamic world, you'll never see five-year-old so, kids drinking so beer. I, I have a question. Um, yeah. So you, you keep bringing up this point about how many people have been saved from fetal alcohol syndrome because of Muhammad outlawing alcohol. Okay, great. How many millions and millions of children do you think have been denied the right and privilege of adoption because of Muhammad's lust problem? Muhammad went to the door okay. of his adopted son Zaid and opened, uh, he opened the door, but Zainab, his wife, and Muhammad desired to have sex with her. So uh, he has a revelation. Uh, this whole. is all off topic. This is all Muh off topic. Yeah, but, oh, but, but, it, but uh, no, I'll, I'll, I'll release the topic. Defeat with grace. This, so, is my, this is so, my advice for you. Be graceful. So, Ma 
so, okay. so, so Mohammed, okay. I'm not going to, um, I'm not going to go there. I'm not going to go there with you because to, to all you have is this. Son, I'm done. I'm son. done, guys. Do and then, then he gets done. another revelation. Do go go next, we do want to go to the okay. next question. Just to okay. Okay. Yeah. We, Listen, we, do, we, we, we want to keep start, it moving yeah. along, and I can tell that this yeah. is going to start to derail it. And both of you have gone on things that aren't science. To be fair, that's happened in both instances because the fetal alcohol syndrome thing is essentially an inference as well. Um, you, there's no really what, well, that was a direct question. Right, I mean, uh, like so, let, let's alcohol, just go. Yeah. We'll go into the yeah. we'll go into the both of you have gone yeah. off, and I can I don't in, to prevent it from us, but we'll just yeah. get to there's two more questions here, and then I think that uh, okay. Jim will get to super chats. So, Jay Shai again, the Bible has ancient cosmology in it, it is not scientifically accurate. They believe water surrounding a solid sky and pillars holding earth up out of water. John Walton goes through all of this. That seems more of a statement than a question. So I guess I just read it. Uh, and Slam RN uh, question, does Nadir read Arabic? Yes, I do. So I'm not an Ara natural. That's the last one. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not a like a native, uh, you know, Arabic speaker. I'm originally from Pakistan, but I picked it up at a second language. I'm kind of at an intermediate level. Uh, anybody who does know Arabic, uh, for example, like this guy named Christian Prince who ran away from me, in this debate challenge, but anyone, I don't care, please come forward. We'd love to talk to you about the Quran and science. Um, that's the last question or? We've that got, was the last question got, I have. Uh, Jim may have okay, more super chats. We do have just a, a few more. These are quick ones. Yeah. So thanks so much stripper liquor as they go by. Who said, do science errors negate any metaphysical values? I'm not sure what that means. Um, is that for me or for Nadir? Uh, I think maybe they mean by values, metaphysical truths in this case. So like, does do science errors? Yeah, I, I suppose it could be answered by both of you, whether or not science errors negate metaphysical truths about a position. Well, it depends uh, on the view one takes of inspiration. Uh, the biblical view of inspiration is different from the Quranic view. Muslims believe that the Quran is dictated to Muhammad and the Quran is eternal. Uh, and so finding scientific blunders or historical mistakes or anachronisms in the Quran, I think shatters the Islamic worldview. Whereas um, finding uh, plausible uh, cases of mistakes or errors in the Bible, uh, does not necessarily refute Christianity. It might just cause us to revise our view of inerrancy. Um, so I, I, I don't think that the core propositional tenets of the Christian faith are challenged by finding you know, peripheral matters of um, error in, in, the, in the Bible. Gotcha. And if you'd like to respond to your, of course, you can respond as well. Well, you know, if there are scientific errors in either the Bible or the Quran, then this cannot be the word of God. Okay. And especially if you look in, and, and this is a debate, which actually, you know, John is, is refusing to have, the scientific, it's not just a matter of the Bible contradicts science. It's a matter that the scientific errors in the Bible have hurt many people because people actually follow them. But what's the miracle of the Quran is number one, as we have seen tonight, there are no explicit scientific errors in the Quran, but it corrects the scientific errors of the Bible. And this is something absolutely amazing. And I hope that maybe one day you know, uh, you know, we could discuss that over here. Now, I've had that discussion with Jay Smith, and what unfortunately, so sadly, what I've found is that Christians are now running away uh, from science. You know, I really believe that this debate on science, it's a debate to end all debates, you know, because science pinpoints one religion to be the truth, and that is the Quran. It's in perfect harmony with science. And not only that, but there are statements in the Quran which agree with modern science, which we've only recently discovered. And the last part, it corrects the scientific error of the Bible. If you, I have a discussion where I go into detail on this topic, you can email me and I'll send it to you, na1971-1990 at gmail.com. And, uh, you know, I, I would invite uh, in fact, one said, okay, the Christians are running away, James, uh, Shannon, uh, I challenge you guys to come challenge the Quran, or is the Quran a scientific miracle? If you like, we could do that debate as well, okay? Thank you. And next up, we do have a couple more Super Chats. We might not have time to get to everybody's questions, so forgive me for that, folks, but do want to say thanks so much. Fred Sucks is their real name, so <laughs> thanks, Fred, who said... Shannon Q is beautiful. 
Oh, thanks, Fred. You don't suck. I appreciate well, you. Um, <laughs> thanks for making James say that too. That was fun for me. Let's, uh, <laughs> let's not go nuts, Fred. All right. Thanks for that. Gravity Axe, thanks for your super chat. They said, Nadir, should I drink water from the Ga- oh, the Ganges River? Okay, so uh, if you drink from the, the Ganges, it's obviously polluted water. When you have regular, safe bottled water, tap water, why would you do that? That wasn't the case, you know, 1,400 years ago. All what you see in Saudi Arabia with the big towers and buildings and beautiful cities, this is all artificial, okay? You can travel for thousands of miles, hundreds of miles, and you will find no water source but what I just showed you oh, you're going to be drinking from that water. But like I said, just as we see today, the Arabs had their uh, uh, drinking filtration techniques. So the answer is you're going to drink from that water or else you're going to die. And so will I and so will everybody else. But of course, you just don't drink directly out of there. But like I said, if you looked at the Hadith, which I was actually quoting, uh, that was referring to when Muhammad said this water is pure, it is referring to uh, ablution, meaning a ritual uh, washing, not for consumption. But consumption-wise, yes, it's okay. You have to drink from that. There's no, there's no, there are no alternatives. Gotcha. Thank you very much. And that was the last of the questions, folks. Thanks so much. We are not going to get to every one, but I uh, want to say thanks so much for our speakers for being here tonight. It's been a true pleasure. We really appreciate you spending your time here with us. It's been a wild one. And so thanks just uh, for participating here tonight. Thank you. Absolutely. And they are linked down in the description, just so you know. If you were listening, you're like, hmm, I want to hear more. Well, there's your chance just right down there in that little description box. Also, I happen to link Shannon Q because uh, she did a great job tonight. We appreciate her help. She really saved me as I was like scrambling after the last debate. So whew, very fun, folks. Really appreciate all of you. You guys always make this a blast. This has been super fun. And then we'll send the receipt, the donation receipt uh, to both of the speakers. That's what we usually do. I'll send it to Shannon too. And that's just for like kind of like transparency and accountability. But if you're here even for the first time and you're like, can I see that receipt too? Because I mean, if you say you're going to send it to charity, you know, I want to like, it's fair that we validate it or, you know, be able to check. Totally. Like, no joke. If it's your first time here, shoot me an email at moderndaydebate at gmail.com. We'll show you the receipt as well because we do want to be transparent about that. So thanks, folks, in partnering with us, whether you be Christian, atheist, Muslim, no matter who you are, where you're from, thanks for partnering us, partnering with us for that mission and raising money for that good cause tonight. And just for being here at the channel, we hope you feel welcome no matter what view you come from. So thanks so much. And one last uh, thanks from our co-mod, Shannon, for being here and helping tonight. Or I should say, really taking, uh, basically moderating, and I was the helper. So thanks so much. <laughs> yeah, thanks for helping me, James. I appreciate you being here. <laughs> terrific. So take care, folks. Keep sifting out the reasonable from the unreasonable.